Now, I didn't um, mention all the colleagues from the, the team in, in Siena. Let me at least <laughs> mention a few others. Uh, at the beginning, uh, uh, I started with uh, Ricardo Alessandro and, and Professor Santoro. Let me now mention, in addition to Gianmaria Valeria, Valeria Piergigli, uh, she's with us uh, for, this, uh, for this event, and uh, Mario Perini, of course. Uh, and then uh, uh, Daniele Ferrari and Pasquale Anichino, they're also in the, in the um, participants uh, team of the Giambone project. And now the floor to Ricardo for uh, sharing uh, the, the second part. <laughs> Let me just, Ricardo was <laughs> forgetting about uh, um, uh, the speakers of this uh, session. And I'm very, very grateful to Professor Pardolesi and to yet another colleague from the University of Siena, Federico Lenzerini, for uh, having taken the time to prepare a presentation and delivering it now. Ricardo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marco. Yes, so as anticipated by Professor Ventura, we are, now, we are now going to start the second part of this uh, keynote session of our conference. Uh, our two uh, uh, next speakers are indeed Professor Pardolesi and Professor Lenzerini. Uh, they will speak about uh, uh, themes which can be considered, again, uh, key themes uh, within our research project, uh, but uh, uh, let's say more directly connected uh, with the specific areas uh, that we will deal with uh, in the next uh, uh, two days. So Professor Pardolesi will uh, uh, address uh, issues of privacy protection uh, and uh, Federico Lenzerini will address uh, uh, area, the area of uh, uh, migrants' rights and asylum policy of the European Union. The first speaker is Professor Roberto Pardolesi. Professor Roberto Pardolesi is a professor emeritus at Louis Guido Carli University in Rome since 2019. He's also a full professor of comparative law and uh, private law always at Lewis uh, uh, University in Rome, uh, in Lewis Guido Carli University. It's, uh, we, we will need much time to recall all uh, the multitude uh, of his affiliations. Uh, let me just recall that uh, he's a member of the International Academy of Comparative Law, of the steering committee of the European Association of Law and Economics, and of the scientific committee of the National Antitrust Authority. Uh, the title of his presentation is The Right to be Forgotten, Critical Issues. Uh, Professor Pardolesi, the floor is yours. Thank you that much. Uh, I'm not very familiar with this uh, kind uh, of stuff. I wonder whether it works. Can you, can you hear me, hopefully? Since I feel a bit discriminated, I am presenting some slides, uh, and uh, the, the only thing that I can see my monitor is just my slide. Hopefully, hopefully, I am in touch with you. Let me thank you, uh, Isabella Mazet, for heroically tutoring me at the very beginning, Professor Ventura for supporting and rescuing me. A few minutes ago, I was collapsing uh, with, with this kind of stuff, uh, and the chairman, Professor uh, Pavoni, for uh, introducing me with kind words. Uh, and I will come to my uh, topics. I will. Uh, I will focus on a uh, uh, precise aspect of the privacy uh, environment, let's say. So we'll focus on the right uh, to be forgotten. Right to be forgotten, which, uh, let me say, is uh, uh, in a sense a blockbuster. It's really as of now a blockbuster, it's, as it, uh, it is attested by the fact that in the last uh, two years and a half, it emerges, emerged three times. Uh, uh, as an issue uh, in front of the uh, Supreme Court, uh, this, uh, this civil Supreme Court of Cassazione in Italy, for instance, uh, in the last seven months, it emerged three times uh, at the Karlsruhe uh, Court, the Bundesverfassungsgericht, which uh, three times uh, uh, enacted uh, judgments uh, on the uh, rights of Ferguson, precisely the right to. to be forgotten, or if you prefer, right to oblivion. And recently, there was also an important, uh, prestigious atelier organized by the Coup de Cassation Francais, uh, uh, 
was uh, chaired by Christophe Soulard and uh, one of the, uh, 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 the president of the, the, uh, of the criminal, uh, criminal uh, Chambre Criminelle de la Cour de Cassation, uh, uh, which was attended by the uh, apical courts from uh, Europe and elsewhere, devoted to the privacy issues and particularly to the right to be forgotten as uh, a function vital of our modern society. So it uh, seems to be really something which deserves uh, some attention. Now, uh, um, let me, uh, let me, obviously it doesn't, okay. Uh, let me uh, frame the environment, uh, the conceptual environment. When we deal with such an uh, issue, then uh, uh, obviously we are uh, involved with a uh, uh, temporal dimension. Since uh, as time goes, goes by, uh, dust accumulates, obviously, and uh, feelings uh, are, in a sense, diluted and dispersed. Psychologically wounds uh, probably heal, synapses get lost, and, uh, well, at the end of the day, memory vanishes and people forget. What happens is that the internet, meanwhile, does not forget. If, if you post something in the, in the internet, you will find it somewhere. So the oblivion is uh, in the nature of the things, uh, of the uh, 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 things that we do and should be dealt with as such. So that we can simply accept it as a natural phenomenon, uh, we can fight against it, and so we can passively strive in order to uh, remember. So that memorials, uh, the shua, whatever you want, something that you don't want to forget, that you want, on the contrary, to recall as much as possible. Or on the other hand, uh, it may very well be that there is something in our past that we don't like that much. We would rather prefer to remove. Uh, so that uh, 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 time can be relied upon in order to uh, get rid of it, basically. Now, this is more or less the channel uh, presented in a very casual way, but the question, our question is, and is a legal one. So the question is, uh, uh, what about a legal pretense to uh, oblivion? That's the point. And so we are, uh, 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 probably left with uh, what uh, I would call a basic taxonomy with uh, three uh, epiphanies. Let's say, if you prefer, three entries. The first is uh, a pre-digital right to oblivion, right to be forgotten, that would be, so in a sense, uh, traditional. And uh, 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 we call it, uh, we will call it a uh, uh, traditional right to oblivion. Then we have the uh, a second entry, the so-called European right to be forgotten, which is obviously the very core of our discussion for some reason that we will explore in a while. And we have a third entry, which is uh, still in search of definition, possibly even of the level. Uh, let us stipulate for a while that uh, uh, we can call it archival oblivion. Uh, now, obviously, the three epiphanies and the three phenomena, the three appearances, in a sense, uh, converge and partially overlap. So they uh, turn out to be finally different. So it's a, it's a kind of a, a, a multifaceted problem. And let's try to figure it out what happens with the, with the, the uh, traditional dimension, the first step of my analysis. So, uh, Jean Valjean is the protagonist uh, of the uh, celebrated uh, uh, masterpiece. Uh, you, you may remember Le Miserable. And obviously had something in his past that he would have liked to, to, to conceal. But there was Javert over there, uh, who was implacably uh, was there to remind uh, Jean Valjean of his uh, debt to justice and so, forth, so on and so forth. So this is more or less the typical dimension 
of the traditional right to be forgotten. So you have a previous phase of uh, uh, publicity so that our, uh, uh, our guy is just in the spotlight of the public interest for some reason. Then time goes by and uh, hopefully people forget or are distracted, absent-minded, don't uh, uh, think any longer and uh, the connection is uh, broken. And uh, well, then you have a diachronic switch so that there is uh, an upsurge of a, 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 a rejuvenated interest, public interest or curiosity, if you prefer, so that our guy is again because of a republication, be it on a, a newspaper or a movie, whatever it is, in a, a new setting, a different one, where possibly public interest uh, does not hold any longer. At least uh, it is not the same interest that was uh, justifying the original publication. And this is more or less the prototypical uh, uh, case. And there are uh, famous examples for them. One, uh, a celebrated one, is the case of Melvin, Melvin versus Ride, uh, an uh, um, um, appellate uh, court of California case of 1931. Uh, the case is about a girl. Uh, her name was Gabrielle, Gabrielle Darley. She was a prostitute in New Orleans uh, and uh, she killed her lover uh, uh, because he was not reliable. He didn't abide by the promise to marry her. And so it happened in 1999. And she was, uh, she underwent a trial, uh, obviously with a lot of publicity in 1925. And finally, and surprisingly enough, she was acquitted. She had good reason to kill her lover. And she moved to California, find some one Melvin, who, who was actually willing to marry her. And she started a new life, a respectful new life, uh, which was uh, interrupted by the presentation of a movie. The Red Kimono. The Red Kimono was one of the first appearances uh, of uh, Tyron, uh, Tyron Power, Tyron Power, famous American star, the, 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 the Romina Powers for Italian, while well, I'm gossiping, obviously, uh, for Ita the Italian uh, public, Romina Powers' father, and the fair was uh, a famous movie. The problem with Melvin versus with the movie was that Gabriel in the movie. Uh, featured with her uh, name. So there was a problem of defamation. Defamation referred to a past uh, story. And the other famous uh, case is William Sidis versus New Yorker. William Sidis is a very famous in America, uh, a very famous uh, wonder kid. At the age of five, he was uh, uh, composing a new, uh, a new system. Uh, of uh, uh, mathematical stuff, uh, logarithmic stuff, something like that. He graduated at the age of 11, somebody that you would kill, uh, possibly. And he was uh, exposed to publicity by his uh, father, an uh, Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian uh, engineer, as a kind of a phenomenon. And he uh, finally graduated in, uh, uh, obviously, law, um, uh, um, at um, uh, uh, Cambridge, obviously, after law school, at the age of 18, and when he uh, 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 got to maturity, he disappeared, literally disappeared. He abandoned the public dimension. So that the New Yorker uh, discovered him some years later in a, a typical presentation uh, 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 where are they now? Something like that it was a series, and it was the first, uh, the first uh, uh, step of the, of the series. And the side is sued, and but he didn't want, didn't win. And according to according to Pietro Rechino, who, who is the father of, of all uh, uh, private scholars, uh, private law scholars in Italy, he died because of the discomfort for the uh, final outcome of the case. Uh, yeah, which was a judge in 1940. 
and rejected by the American Supreme Court. Uh, the, the real story of Silas, if you want to, to, to know it, is in the, the pages of the a book L'Aguila, authored by Robert Piercy. You never, you never heard about it, but you may have heard about uh, the, the first and uh, famous book of uh, Robert Piercy, uh, The Den and the Art of Maintenance of Motorbike which is a wonderful book, by the way. Anyway, be back. This is the typical, the typical situation. It is, and so those are the precedents. And we have uh, something in Italy like that. Uh, it was introduced, the, the right to be forgotten, in 1998 with a judgment by the Supreme Court. And was a typical story. It was a typical story, the typical narrative of somebody, the author of a crime, uh, being uh, undergoing a, a trial, being condemned, by paying his debt to justice, uh, and then uh, uh, leaving uh, the jail, uh, and coming to a new life, uh, uh, anonymous life, obviously, and then somebody, somebody uh, um, uh, again uh, focuses on him and uh, and uh, exposes him to uh, um, to uh, publicity he wouldn't like any longer. And that's the, the typical case, and the typical 1998 case has been recently, very recently replicated by the season of uh, July uh, 2019 by the uh, Supreme Court. So, more or less, you see the, the situation is, uh, in a sense, uh, consolidated as, uh, as long as the um, uh, traditional dimension of the right to be forgotten is concerned. Let me just add that it may be considered a byproduct, so it's a kind of, a, of offspring of the right of privacy uh, in the uh, in at a la Warren Brandis at the very beginning of the story. So uh, it belongs uh, to the world to do, to the apes, uh, as against the apes not. In the sense that uh, uh, this guy, this dimension is typical, who are in the spotlight of the public attention, uh, they may be unwillingly there because they have been, uh, uh, they have offered some crime, but nonetheless, they are just uh, on the stage, let's say. They have fallen in public domain. So that, uh, that was the traditional dimension of privacy. As of now, we are. Uh, experiencing its uh, proletarization in the sense that uh, there has been a new uh, phenomenon, a, a new uh, uh, setting, let's say, with the impressive wave of statutes about uh, uh, personal data protection. They have been uh, scrutinized by Greenleaf, and more or less it, uh, we, we have, as of now, uh, around the world, uh, 120 statutes. Uh, 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 featuring some uh, discipline about personal data protection. Uh, obviously, this is completely different since it's a situation where everybody, uh, the quisque de popolo, we would say, the evanots, have uh, are involved, uh, each of us. Uh, so this is the uh, 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 pre-digital dimension of the uh, right to be forgotten. And let's move to the uh, second epiphany the European digital oblivion. Uh, uh, the case, everybody knows it, it's a famous case, Google Spain versus Croatia, uh, uh, which is a judgment by the uh, Court of Justice of the European Union of 1914. And it's a famous one, Croatia was a lawyer in, uh, in Barcelona and uh, uh, he didn't pay uh, taxes, and so he underwent uh, a, a, an administrative proceeding. Uh, and since, uh, a, uh, well, and uh, uh, at the end of the day, he uh, underwent a public auction sale of uh, his house, which was uh, announced by the La Vanguardia, the uh, the uh, Catalan most important newspaper, twice. In 1998, something like that. 14 year, year, uh, years later, the first uh, um, outcome, the first result of a query 
uh, uh, starting from the name of Correja in the uh, in Google, the first the first result was precisely the announcement by the Vanguardia that uh, um, uh, Correja's house uh, was being uh, forfeited and so on and so forth. And obviously, Correja was not very happy about that. And the file he tried to get rid of this kind of connection with the authority in charge of the uh, uh, control of the um, personal data in uh, Spain and they said that uh, the archive by La Vanguardia was absolutely lawful and uh, so the only possibility was to refer the case to uh, the uh, Court of Justice. Uh, uh, the Court of Justice, uh, uh, which unexpectedly, this was really unexpected, decided to uh, sponsor courageous position. By the way, think of it, it is something quite paradoxical in the attempt of Correja to get uh, his uh, uh, story removed from uh, public knowledge and he has become famous because of, of this story. Everybody, obviously, uh, now, as of now, uh, remembers Correja as the protagonist of this uh, event. And, uh, well, anyway, the uh, uh, judgment was a shock and uh, a, a surprising short circuit with uh, regard to the previous positions. And it, it apparently, apparently stands in a metonymic way for the right to erasure, so that, uh, 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 let's say that uh, uh, I would like to quote from a recent uh, judgment uh, from uh, uh, by the Court of Justice, twenty uh, fourth uh, um, September two thousand nineteen, and she is reproposing the Correja holding, suggesting that everybody has a right that the information relating to him or her personally be no longer linked to his or her name by, uh, by a list of results displayed following the search made on the basis of his or her name. Let me go on in this quotation since it really uh, conveys the spirit of the judgment. Without it being necessary in order to find such a right, that the inclusion of the information in question in that list causes prejudice. To the data subject, so that uh, even uh, if there is no uh, uh, defamation, is there is no uh, violation of some privacy interest, uh, we are affirming uh, with uh, uh, such a holding a kind of absolute right to uh, to to have the result removed, which means apparently that uh, the. Uh, um, that there should be erasure of the personal data because of idiosyncratic reaction by the uh, subject involved, by the natural person involved. Actually, the uh, holding by the uh, uh, Correcia case has been, in a sense, uh, now translated into uh, uh, black letters in the law, since now we have the GDPR, and uh, if the data is no longer accurate, is not kept up to date, is not relevant in the particular situation, is for a reason not any longer complete, it can be objected. So according to Article 21st. And uh, eventually, according to Article 17, Paragraph 1, Letter C, of the General Data Protection Regulation, can sell. And the last testimony was the uh, uh, judgment I was referring to right now. Now, can we say that this is uh, a new remedy? The obvious answer is uh, must be positive. Yet, what we really deal with is not so much uh, uh, a new remedy. I would say that we are really dealing with something uh, 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 which might be uh, conceived of as uh, the produce of the technical possibilities and uh, the developments. Actually, what, uh, what, uh, what uh, happens with the uh, 
the Google Spain case, it is that we are introducing a new remedy in the form of the listing, the referencing, which means that the basic publication, the one in the Vanguardia, at the origin of the case is still there and legally uh, uh, present in the original uh, uh, archive in that website, which is obviously available for, for people who are searching the archive of the Catalan newspaper. And the, uh, the news about Croatia uh, public sale is there and uh, is not questionable. But what happens is that the operator is the, of the search, the uh, um, horizontal search gen, is obliged to remove from the list of the results displayed following uh, uh, a query based on the name of the involved person is uh, obliged to cut off all links to certain web, web pages reporting personal data. So that the role, the new role and the new remedy uh, boils down to something like take notice, evaluate, since the problem of evaluation is left with the, uh, Google or the operator of the uh, uh, search engine, uh, which is uh, uh, invested with the uh, obligation to evaluate whether there is uh, uh, a, a, a serious reason for the listing, if the answer, and you know the phenomenon, several million requests of uh, uh, the listing, 25% uh, uh, of them accepted. In Italy, the, 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 the percentage is lower for only, only um, um, uh, uh, um, 40 percent uh, uh, overall, and 25 only in Italy. Sorry about that. So that uh, well, this is the the, the, uh, um, the let's say the uh, new dimension, this uh, digital dimension. Uh, uh, so that what we are left with is uh, that even if the uh, data is present somewhere, is still available, available to people. Uh, uh, nonetheless, uh, the treatment by Google and the like, and so the possibility for everybody just to use the search engine in order to uh, gather some kind of information is illegal treatment, which means that there is, as a final outcome, a, the uh, affirmation of uh, the right of information, informational self-determination, more or less the way it was presented by Kohler in the Gering Year Bookers uh, in, the, uh, in the 80s of the 19th century, and possibly Brandeis uh, was attending Kohler's uh, uh, lectures in, in Germany. Well, the problem with uh, such an approach is that you run into the dangers of uh, some some form of uh, eugenics uh, of right of personality, so that I just shape my my personality according to my uh, my wish, let's say, and uh, we incline also to some kind of apologetic, geographic, uh, uh, autobiographism. But what is uh, really involved in the story and the real goal of the um, of the new uh, the new um, remedy uh, uh, is the uh, reduction of accessibility retrievability in the sense that if the data is uh, easily available to people who have no serious reason for uh, uh, retrieving it uh, but just some gossiping some uh, uh, some kind of epidemic curiosity then, then uh, that, that would be uh, to possibly too much. And so if you reduce the extensibility of the data, uh, 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 then you uh, um, really uh, succeed in, uh, in uh, 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 avoiding the promotion of less worthy interests to get your information. More or less, the idea is uh, that uh, is such that, and has been uh, has been presented by the uh, uh, our Supreme uh, Court of Cassazione in a, a recent judgment. Uh, let me quote: "It's a judgment of 27 March 
2020, uh, so quite fresh. And so uh, uh, the, our, our court is suggesting that in the context of the web, republication, the way it was in the uh, uh, traditional uh, um, epiphany of the right to be forgotten is no longer necessary, since the information, once inserted, is generated no longer deleted, deleted and uh, remain available, uh, or at least abstract, abstractly evaded, so that uh, uh, permanent accessibility, that's the problem. Uh, 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 and that, uh, let me just add a, a, a kind of a suggestion by the same uh, uh, Court di Cassazione. Given that, then, uh, that there is, there can be no real claim to the cancellation of one's past, this is really important, important, a sensitive point. We understand that the real problem is represented by the distortion of the subject's image built, or built up over time after the, the now forgotten story caused by the re-emergence of the news. So in a sense, we come to some kind of a, a feeling that uh, reducing retrievability may be even reasonable, but it does not, this is really important, it does, it does not imply any absolutist conception of an overriding idiosyncratic primacy of the right to be forgotten in the uh, form of right uh, to erase whatever you dislike in your story, in your past. I can move to uh, the, uh, the Court of Justice in uh, uh, one of uh, the binary decision of the 24th of, se of September to, to, to 2019, and the, the, the Court of Justice is suggesting that the right to the protection of personal data, data, is not an absolute right. So she is retreating. The court, the court is, it is retreating, sorry about that, uh, from the original position. Uh, it must be the right, uh, uh, must be considered in relation to its uh, function in society and be balanced against other fundamental rights in, accord in accordance with the principle of proportionality. So that uh, I, I, at the end of the day, you should confront the protection by uh, Article, uh, Article 9 of the directive, the, the court was dealing with the directive in uh, 9546, uh, and Article 85 of the regulation uh, um, 679 of, two, uh, of 2016, which is uh, uh, representing the public interest to knowledge to, to inform and uh, to be informed. So that this, uh, the same uh, uh, Court of Justice is, is retreating from the uh, original absolutist uh, position. And we find an important confirmation by the Bundesverfassungsgericht to a uh, uh, decision. The most important one is the, uh, 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 the, the, the judgment of 6 November 2019, uh, uh, Rechtsaufergessen, the Este, and uh, this uh, important court, uh, uh, which is not only responsible for the uh, uh, pronunciation about the quantitative easing program, the controversial decision of uh, uh, 5 May, last 5 May, but is a big, important court, suggesting that the general right of personality does not imply a right to be forgotten in a sense that can uh, be uh, uh, in principle controlled by the person concerned alone. Which information is remembered as interesting, admirable, offensive, or reprehensible is, in this respect, not subject to the unilateral decision of the person concerned. Thus, the general right of personality, Algemeine Personlichkeitsrecht, does not imply the right to have all previous personal information exchanged in the course of communication process deleted from the internet. This is real, let me say, this is really important. And this way, the Bundesverfassungsgericht, so uh, reneging the, the underlying decision of the Bundesgerichtshof, find the way, find, find the connection with the um, 
uh, Euro, uh, with the uh, Court of uh, uh, European Court of uh, Human Rights uh, with uh, uh, its uh, judgments uh, in the Manfred Albert and Wolfgang Verlet cases, the, the assassination of the actor Sedlmayer in 1990. It's a typical story of, uh, of the right to be forgotten. And in the uh, Fuchsman case, uh, of 2018. So you see that there is, uh, despite our idea, that there is uh, an overwhelming uh, uh, um, right to be forgotten in form of imposing uh, a crude listening, there is a strong resistance. And let's move. Uh, uh, President, do I have five minutes? Uh, four, three? Can I manage to speak for another three five. minutes? Five minutes, if, if you can do that with five minutes, that would be great. No, even less, possible. So let's move to the archival oblivion. Archival oblivion is the third, is the third uh, uh, entry. And uh, obviously, online archives uh, are the digital version of the traditional, everlasting, dusty archives. Uh, they exhibit a documentary vocation and uh, obviously capture and uh, make stable a fragment, a fragment of our history, making sure that there will be no, uh, uh, no uh, tragedy like in Alexandria uh, uh, Library and so on and so forth, that our informational treasure won't be lost. Now, so now we can recognize that there is uh, an obvious interest of the, uh, um, um, of the uh, publishers for uh, collecting uh, uh, the memories of the newspaper. But, uh, and, uh, and so uh, press publishers are obviously interested uh, in uh, offering service like that. But there is uh, obviously also a uh, public interest, uh, a public interest uh, that uh, turned out to be eventually a uh, historical research interest. And archives uh, should feature, this is really important, completeness and thoughtfulness and so what happens is and again we have some an important decision by by what i have not done so uh, um they should uh, their cars should be complete and you cannot uh um uh re revamp reshape accommodate and uh, uh, eventually change change them they reflect uh, a piece of history uh, so what happens when uh, uh, you find that over time there has been a, a change, a modification in the uh, in the data and the, the information which was originally provided. Since, for instance, there was a condemnation the trial, then the trial has been uh, uh, has undergone uh, uh, some appeal, has been uh, uh, reshaped, and so on and so forth. Then uh, what happens here? Uh, uh, you would expect that, uh, um, uh, and, and this is a suggestion that is coming from the Court of Justice with the uh, other decision of 2019, that uh, the, um, uh, there is something more than an exception to uh, the right to be forgotten uh, uh, relating to the public figure. There is also the possibility that uh, 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 there is uh, an uh, uh, interest to the public to know, so that, uh, 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 in a sense, uh, you should uh, balancing this interest with the interest uh, of the involved person to uh, have his image represented in a correct way. So if there is something to be uh, upgraded, updated, well, if there must be a con contextualization, which makes it clear that the, pre the previous information was true at the time, but uh, 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 um, uh, has been uh, uh, changed um, after. Uh, um, well, then uh, there should be the possibility of adding some kind of information that makes it, it, it clear that the previous one is no longer correct. This makes a difference uh, as against the typical uh, uh, paper uh, um, archive. Since the paper archive is there, cannot be changed. Is there uh, black letters? 
And uh, whereas with the new technology, we have the possibility to add something to contextualize. This is the kind of break in the parallelism between uh, historical, traditional, uh, uh, papery, microfilm archives uh, and those digital uh, new archives. The new archives may be, in a sense, uh, updated. They may be, in a sense, correct. But, uh, uh, well, what we are left there with at the end of the day is that we don't have any uh, uh, solution of one to fair, one, one size fit all. And uh, privacy, this is clear, is important, but it's not paramount. And we should reconsider. And what uh, I will uh, conclude with is a kind of, of principle recipe that I'm deriving from those judgments uh, coming from uh, the apical courts in Europe. Let me present this recipe. One, well, first entry, A, when a generic pretends to give the information in a the specialized way that is, that is uh, through a horizontal search engine, the typical research, a typical query that I may do right now, um, comes to grip with uh, an as generic aspiration to control and keep for oneself the flow of personal information concerning past events, uh, but also present events, obviously. Then the latter, I mean, the, uh, the, the aspiration to oblivion will, as a rule, prevail and will trigger a delisting remedy. B, second entry, if a plausible, serious, coherent, consistent public interest to know emerges, it will, as a rule, prevail, even if, B1, the republication of the information turn out to be harmful for the modern natural person because of a, of a, a vulnerous uh, a, a one to goodwill to reputation or because of the diffusion of facts, invasion of price, of privacy, of whatever you want. Uh, B2, if the emerging public interest uh, meanwhile vanishes, we are sent back to the first answer A, so that the, again the private interest to be uh, forgotten will uh, prevail. C, if the conflict in, uh, involves a documentary data set which stocks information for research purposes, uh, the request of erasure becomes recessive in the sense that the interested person can only ask for the contextualization when possible of what has become, meanwhile, obsolete. So that the role should be a sort of notice, evaluate, and update following the initiative of the natural person. Uh, just to finish, remember that in such a case, the parallelism of traditional paper uh, archive with the digital one uh, does no longer hold, since only the latter admits this kind of, of contextualization because of the, the uh, technology we are dealing with. Finally, erasure should be limited as a last resort remedy to exceptional circumstances when uh, the uh, information is really fake. Uh, uh, um, without any informational value. Again, uh, this is possible only from, for digital archives, since uh, with uh, regard to traditional uh, ones, such an initiative would end up uh, in censorship or even worse uh, in uh, uh, Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451 story, something like that. But even if you, when you consider the possibility that the erasure, the erasure is the best conceivable uh, uh, remedy, then you might uh, factor in the possibility of deny a denial, discrediting the author of the false statement. And you should be, you should consider the attempt. And that's uh, the story of the right to be forgotten, where we stand, we stand right now. So the, the following question, which I left to your attention is, uh, anonymization of, of judicial data? Is, 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 is that really serious? Is something that we should uh, really pursue? Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much.
Professor Pardolesi for this deeply interesting presentation indeed, uh, so rich of uh, insights that we will capitalize when we will discuss issues of uh, data protection and protection of privacy this coming Saturday. Uh, it's time, uh, if you please may switch on your mic, switch off your microphone, Professor Pardolesi. I'll do that. If Thank you so much. And so we move on immediately to our next right. lecture. Is, uh, Professor Federico Lenzerini, uh, who is uh, a colleague here at the University of Siena. He is a professor of international law at the Department of Political and International Sciences uh, at the University of Siena. Uh, he has also many affiliations. Uh, let me just mention that he is a member of the International Law Association and is also a particularly active member in the International Law Association because he has been uh, and is currently still a special rapporteur on the rights of indigenous peoples there. Um, Professor Lindzerini has also been a practitioner of international law. He has uh, done consultancies with UNESCO and is also a counsel, has also been counsel to the Italian Ministry for Foreign Affairs in Cultural Heritage Issues. Um, he will uh, go, it's going to speak about uh, you know, we move on from uh, flows of uh, data uh, to flows of migrants indeed so uh, issues of migrant rights and asylum issues uh, uh, the title of this presentation is the common european asylum system recent challenges and still unresolved problems professor lenzerini the floor is yours Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Ricardo. Uh, I trust that you uh, listen to me, right? You hear me? Very well, very well. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I also would like to extend my gratitude to the other organizers of this event, Professor Ventura, uh, Professor Palmieri, Professor Santoro, and uh, I stop here because uh, I'm afraid that I would forget some, somebody. And this is a really interesting occasion for me, and I'm very glad to have been invited to present. Um, so as Ricardo said, I'm going to talk about the common European asylum system. I know that tomorrow there will be also presentations about this issue, so we'll try to provide a brief introduction, especially as the title says, about the recent challenges and the structural and unresolved problems of the system today. Uh, as you know, the common European asylum system was born out of the recognition that in an area without internal frontiers, asylum needed to be harmonized. Um, and it was considered that the failure to do that would result, would likely result in the secondary movement of asylum seekers. Uh, that is to say, asylum seekers might move from a state to another with a view to choosing a destination either for personal reasons or because they perceived uh, a given country to offer the most generous asylum policies, irrespective of whether or not this was true. So uh, the abolition of internal borders was deemed to require the strengthening of external border controls, including cooperation in the field of immigration in general and asylum in particular as compensatory measures. Um, there was also the necessity to ensure that all member states of European Union would approach the issue so as to guarantee high standards of protection for refugees. And at the same time, it was necessary to ensure that procedures would be fair, effective, and homogeneous throughout the whole European Union. Uh, just to, to provide an example of how the, the, the situation uh, work before the establishment of the common European asylum system, uh, you know very well that all member states of the European Union are parties and were parties to both the 1951 Refugee Convention and the 1967 New York Protocol. 
And before the establishment of the common European asylum system, many member states, as parties to the Refugee Convention and to the Protocol, had developed national asylum systems to ensure the implementation of these instruments. But the problem was that notable discrepancies existing among them. Just to uh, make a reference to what is probably the most known example of this situation, before the establishment of the Common European Asylum System, when adjudicating applications by uh, refugees, courts, in particular in France and Germany, applied the so-called accountability theory, uh, according to which the concept of persecution uh, to which the Geneva Convention refers and a fortiori the convention itself could be considered applicable only when the danger of persecution arose from organs of the state, with the consequence that the state who saw refugees could not be recognized in favor of those persons who were actually victim of persecution coming from private non-state entities, even in situations when the national government was objectively unable to keep the activity of these entities under control. So this greatly restricted the scope of application of the Geneva Convention in some member states, while in others uh, was much broader. And the common European asylum system, among other things, uh, came to try to correct these problems. Uh, the adoption of the common European asylum system took place in two phases. During the first phase between 1999 and 2005, several legislative measures uh, for harmonizing common minimum standards for asylum were applied. And these minimum standards included five key components, which have later been revised and improved. And at present, the common European asylum system, as we know it, is comprised of stronger, more comprehensive and precise versions of the original minimum standards. In particular, it includes the revised Asylum Procedures Directive, the revised Reception Conditions Directive, the revised Qualification Directive, the revised Dublin Regulation. At present, we have uh, the third version, Dublin Third. Uh, of this regulation, and then the revised Eurodac regulation. All these instruments uh, were adopted between 2011 and 2013, and in some way they are already outdated for the reasons that I'm going to explain. Uh, before going into details with respect to the specific structural problems characterizing the common European asylum system, just a couple of minutes for some statistical data. Uh, these data are important because they're strictly connected with the problems that I'm going to illustrate. Uh, as you know very well, asylum flows are not constant, nor they are equitably distributed across the European Union. Uh, in terms of numbers, for instance, they have varied from a peak of uh, 4,000 and 2,500 applications uh, in 2001, uh, 400, sorry, 400, and they, they got down to under uh, 200,000 in 2006. In 2012, they were 336,000. In 2014 and 2016, during the refugee crisis due to the, uh, the situation in Syria in particular, more than 1 million asylum seekers traveled to Europe in search of protection. And since the European Union failed to coordinate a rapid and effective response, this situation led some of the national asylum systems to reach a breaking point. Uh, then, in the following years, the numbers decreased again, but after four years of a slight annual decrease, in 2019, 612,000 first-time asylum seekers applied for international protection in member states, mainly coming from Syria, Afghanistan, and Venezuela. Uh, so, 
What are the problems of structural character to which I was referring? First of all, we have a long lasting inability of member states to properly apply European Union rules. This happens, first of all, at the registration stage. As you know, the registration stage is the gateway to the common European asylum system. And some member states have been unable or unwilling to register all those who enter the territory. Uh, in some cases, due to migrants' refusal to provide fingerprints or to the lack of documentation allowing to identify them. In other cases, just by reason of a lack of capacity by these countries. Then at the reception stage, some national asylum systems suffer chronic underinvestment and lack the necessary flexibility to react to the changing characteristics of immigration flows. Also, as you probably know as well, there are some problems with the Dublin regulation, which uh, in its current version is at its third revision. So it has already been revised several times. And even in the last revised version, Dublin doesn't work fairly, uh, especially for the reason that the most commonly used criterion is that of the first country of arrival. And in light of this, the responsibility falls disproportionately on the border countries. Second, the Dublin regulation does not work efficiently. And in particular, it is inefficient because despite the criteria uh, of attributing responsibility to the first country of arrival, most applicants seek asylum in a different country to the one in which they arrived. And of course, this increased all the, 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 the procedural uh, problems existing, characterizing the common European asylum systems. Thirdly, uh, the Dublin regulation jeopardizes the rights of refugees because a fair and efficient examination of asylum applications is not guaranteed in all member states. And additionally, the allocation of responsibility is applied in a very disparate way. For instance, by uh, not taking into account the presence of family members, uh, applying the humanitarian clause very restrictively, and as already said, using the country of first arrival as the main criterion. Indeed, uh, the fact that these problems exist is very well known because Dublin third is presently under revision. And the idea would be to streamline and supplement the current rules with a corrective allocation mechanism. And this mechanism would be triggered automatically uh, when a member state would be faced with a disproportionate number of asylum seekers. But as you can imagine, this is probably the key problem today of the common European asylum system. And many member states are not willing to accept this equitable distribution of asylum seekers in situation of mass influx. Um, there is another problem which is very serious, which lays in the incapacity uh, of making the criteria of adjudication of asylum claims homogeneous among member states. And this means that the methods of evaluation of asylum requests remain today very heterogeneous. Just to give you an idea, as just an example, in 2016, asylum claims coming from Afghan citizens, so we may presume that all these people were more or less in the same situation, and these claims had a recognition rate of 97.0% in Italy, 60.1% in Germany, 34.4% in the Netherlands, and 1.7% in Bulgaria. So uh, especially the difference between Italy and Bulgaria is particularly striking now. And this reflects, as I was saying, the trend concerning other national populations of asylum seekers and all over the, 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 the most recent years. The problem is that, to recapitulate, 
what I have said uh, until now, inefficient asylum systems lead to delays in the assessment of asylum claims and a fortiori to a lack of access to basic services to prolong detention uh, in uh, ad hoc institutions in member states and more in general to an increment of violations of human rights. Many member states in particular today are characterized by asylum procedures which are objectively too long. For instance, in 2015, uh, applicants from Somalia waited an average of 22 months for a first distance decision in Germany. And we may easily understand how a situation of this kind multiplies all the existing problems. Now, uh, of course, the European Union is trying to solve these problems since quite a long time. But the main difficulty is represented by the fact that certain structural deficiencies of the common European asylum system seem to be written in the very DNA of the system itself. Uh, for instance, while the legal instruments composing the, the, the system may be considered taken one by one, uh, well structured, uh, Taken together, they do not uh, effectively solve the problem of how the system as a whole should work when it has to face a sudden and huge influx of immigrants. Also, uh, the, the, the instruments that I had just mentioned have caused a fragmentation of the legal regulation of the system, which in some cases continues to determine even very serious inconsistencies among member states. And then, last but not least, sometimes it is very difficult to translate into practice provisions which are well structured in theory. Uh, for instance, when it comes to the collection of fingerprints, which has become a very important phase for ensuring the correct functioning of the common European asylum system, uh, many problems may arise because the collection of fingerprints may conflict with individuals' human rights, including the right to privacy or even in some cases to physical integrity. Also, uh, despite the existence of very modern techniques, there is still a margin of error in taking the fingerprints. In some cases, the competent state authorities are not even equipped with the necessary human resources and facilities, for instance, working fingerprinting machines. Ideally, of course, the structural weaknesses should be corrected, at least to the extent possible. But this operation would require another drastic revision of the common European asylum system, not only a revision in terms of the specific legal provisions of the formulation, to be more precise, of the legal provisions which compose the system. But uh, member states should be, most of all, rethink the philosophical approach they have adopted so far with respect to uh, asylum and protection of refugees. Uh, and as we can imagine, the problems that I have just described show the urgency, in particular during situations of mass influx of immigrants. And we, we may take again the example of the refugee crisis of 2015-2016, when both the Union and the member states singularly taken were unable to efficiently address the problem. Uh, some countries, and we may mention in particular Greece, Hungary, and Italy, were unable to provide to the registration of immigrants. And this, uh, in practice, led many of those immigrants to move to other member states without control. And the reaction of these other member states, for instance, Germany, resulted in a temporary suspension of the Dublin system. So the system, uh, did not work exactly in the moment when it was most needed to work properly. And there were some uh, remedies which were put in practice 
that seem to work very well, especially the institutional hotspots. And these hotspots were characterized by the support to the states more pressured by immigration flows, uh, support which was provided by experts of other member states, and also by the competent European offices, in particular the European Asylum Support Office. And these hotspots allowed some member states to quickly increase their registration capacity. Italy, for instance, was able to register 2,000 persons per day, and Greece up to 11,000, which is a very high number. But the problem was that uh, the use of these hotspots was too short to have a lasting impact. And several years after the use, policymakers are continuing to discuss on whether such hotspots constitute an exceptional measures, so to be used only in case of huge flows of immigrants, or on the contrary, they could become a permanent measure to be uh, fixed at key uh, external border points of the European Union. Uh, of course, these hotspots could be uh, an excellent measure to try to solve the problem, but what is, uh, is most necessary is an increased willingness of member states to cooperate. And this cooperation should take more forms like, uh, for instance, the establishment of cross-government committees and task forces, the sharing of information, the sharing of reception facilities, and of course, one of the uh, key structural problems is the lack of an harmonization of the criteria for evaluation of asylum requests. But probably what would be most needed is the increment of solidarity to be translated into distribution policies. And this leads us to discuss about the issue of burden sharing. You know very well that this issue has been extensively discussed uh, by the, the European Union institutions and by member states. But so far, European Union member states have been, have been unable to accept even the very idea of establishing a real and efficient system of burden sharing in practice. And we have already seen this problem as applied to the revision of the Dublin regulation. Uh, there are problems, mm, resistances, I would say, of political, economic, but also ideological and philosophical character. And this is a pity if one considers that, for instance, in Africa, the principle of burden sharing was accepted already in 1961 in the African Convention governing the specific aspects of refugee problems in Africa, there is an article, the, the second article at paragraph four, affirming that where a member state finds difficulty in continuing to grant asylum to refugees, such member states may appeal directly to other member states or through the African Union and all other member states in a spirit of African solidarity uh, shall uh, adopt international cooperation with the appropriate measures to lighten the burden of the member granting asylum. Uh, so in my opinion, this is the issue on which we should work more. Now, I have another reflection to share. Uh, practically, I have reversed the order of the elements of, the, of my title because First, I have discussed about the structural, still unresolved problems of the common European asylum system. And now my reflection concerns the recent challenges. And as you know very well, in these days, there is a challenge that is the most recent at all, which of course could not be imagined when this event was organized, at least when we decided the title of my presentation. And of course, uh, I'm talking about the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, uh, the impact on the pandemic on the flows of refugees is, is reflected in the most recent numbers. In the first months of 2020, 
The number of asylum applications actually increased. Uh, there was a total of 65,000 applications in January and 61,000 in February. Then the trend dramatically reversed in March with a total of about 35,000 applicants, corresponding to 43% decrease compared to February. And this was the result of the fact that uh, uh, many countries, many member states, have imposed entry bans and travel restrictions due to the pandemic. So the first effect of COVID-19 has been a decrease in the number of applications. But at the same time, it is expected that the number is going to increase already in the summer period. In this respect, the main problem is that the restrictions adopted by the states to face the, the pandemic will not stop irregular migration, uh, nor smuggling activities, but on the contrary, they have increased the levels of uncertainty for migrants about their own destiny. So migrants may be even more willing to find protection in foreign countries. And in fact, first of all, the pandemic may be itself a reason for migration uh, in the sense that migrants can try to uh, flee their own countries in order to escape the risk to be, uh, to be concerned by the pandemic. Of course, in principle, the fact of being in danger of contracting the COVID-19 is not in itself a reason to obtain the recognition of the refugee status. But first of all, in some countries, it may be possible that persons who are COVID-19 positive are subjected to some form of discrimination and persecution. So in this case, pursuant to Article 1 of the Geneva Convention, they would form a particular social group composed by uh, COVID-19 positive people who would be entitled to the recognition of refugee status. But even though uh, we consider the applications by people uh, escaping from COVID-19 would be uh, time to be rejected, the obligation of member states of assessing asylum applications remains so that the procedure uh, should be um, carried out in any event. Second, there are certain indirect consequences which may occur. And one of these indirect consequences could be a resurgence, resurgence of the ISIS in Middle East, because now the, the local troops and police forces are concentrated by uh, relief against uh, COVID-19. And so they do not pay sufficient attention any longer to certain extremist groups. And so they could take the occasion to uh, become strong and strong again. And of course, you know that people fleeing from these extremist groups like ISIS are entitled to the recognition of refugee status. Third, another huge problem of practical character is represented by the fact that the activities usually carried out in case of immigration flows, necessarily imply human contacts, and it would be virtually impossible to keep the social distance. Let us think about, uh, for instance, first shelter, humanitarian legal assistance, provisional services, uh, measures of special assistance for unaccompanied children, and so on. And this is very much related also to the fact that many European member states uh, European Union member states commonly use detention for asylum seekers pending the assessment of their applications. And of course, especially in cases of massive flows, it is virtually impossible to guarantee the necessary health measures, both for immigrants and for workers, and especially the, the social distance that would be necessary in this particular time. So as a consequence of the uh, foregoing, uh, limitations on movement, on the one hand, are necessary to manage the virus, but on the other hand, they make it difficult for migrants and asylum seekers to access protection. 
And this may exacerbate inequality, discrimination, and exploitation. There could be an increment of illegal immigration because, of course, the, the legal roots of immigration are closed. And uh, this is further increased by the fact that, uh, understandably, some countries uh, are closing their border supports and, deny access, and are denying access to immigrants, irrespective of whether or not they would be entitled to asylum. For instance, in early April, measures of this kind were taken by some countries, including uh, Italy, Libya, and the United States. And this would deny protection to refugees and uh, to, to the violation of their internationally recognized human rights. Uh, the last point that I would like to mention is that uh, this particular situation determined by the spread of COVID-19 uh, has determined the fact that the fear, the fear of the other, which is something that usually characterizes the civil society when dealing with immigration in normal situations, has further increased due to, the, to, due to the risk of individual health security. And of course, the political leaders may use this rhetoric to further restrict the opportunities of access to the territories, to, to their own territory by asylum seekers. So, in this particular situation, it is even more important than ever to rely on solidarity and burden sharing. Because if the burden of refugees is shared by all the 27 member states, it may be possible to face it in an acceptable way. Otherwise, of course, the countries of first destination uh, would first collapse at least in their asylum system. But in, a, in the long run, the negative effects of this situation, not very long run indeed, the negative effects of this situation will reverberate on all member states and not only on those initially affected by immigration flows. So we should understand the importance of burden sharing, not only in the interest of the member states which are more affected by the flows of refugees at the initial moment, but in the interest of, the, of all European Union member states, of the European Union as a whole, and also for the protection of values that are very important for us. First of all, the protection of human rights, of asylum seekers in particular, and immigrants in general. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Federico. Thank you, Professor Lenderini, uh, also for uh, being compliant with, uh, with the time allocated to the, to the individual speakers. And um, it's now time for discussion. Um, Professor Ventura uh, gave me carte blanche to deal with the situation, so I will, I will, uh, uh, I will uh, uh, use this opportunity. And, and I would invite uh, uh, interventions uh, from the participants, even live interventions. We will not have time for uh, man interventions. So, but if somebody would like to make a live intervention, uh, he or she could simply switch on the microphone and uh, the floor would be hers or his. A second possibility which was communicated to you was also to uh, ask your questions via the chat. So you also have that opportunity. Would somebody like to intervene li uh, live? Uh, hello, Ricardo, here's yes. Patricia speaking. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes. Patricia. Uh, Professor yeah. Patricia Vigna, a colleague from the University of Siena. The floor is yours, Patricia. Uh, thank you. I would like to ask for a question, Professor Jan Walters, as to uh, the evolution, the future evolution of the external action of the European Union. 
And um, my question, uh, which is uh, an interest that I have now because I'm doing research about this, is uh, to know if, uh, in his view, uh, the um, exit of the United Kingdom from uh, the um, from the European Union may uh, help the um, consolidation and uh, the uh, enhancement of the external action of the European Union, in particular, has to the issue of uh, uh, defense, uh, since uh, he mentioned several uh, former acts, uh, maybe uh, referring to uh, the uh, acts of the 1970s that were adopted uh, exactly to allow the entry of the United Kingdom into the European Union. So probably now uh, a more um, a stronger cooperation at the external uh, level could be allowed uh, thanks to the exit of the uh, United Kingdom, if he thinks, um, if he thinks so. Thank you very much. So, Professor Walters, the floor is yours, and uh, I actually had the same question. So, the impact of Brexit on the foreign and security policy of the EU. Okay, my friends, thank you very much for this, uh, of course, very pertinent question. And I wish I could have better news for you in the sense like, yes, now everything is going to go well and we will have great dynamics and so on. My, my answer is actually mixed. First of all, you should not forget that with the loss of the United Kingdom, we are losing a rather important member state in terms of defense capabilities. Eh? One of our nuclear powers uh, is gone. Uh, a, a very big, um, let's say, still military uh, structure with lots of... Uh, facilities, also lots of uh, bases around the world, right? And um, a permanent member of the Security Council also for that matter. So, I mean, to be very honest, um, it, it, from a uh, foreign policy and security policy point of view, the UK's uh, exit is, is really a loss for the EU. Now, of course, as you seem to imply in your question, and, and as we have all been thinking, it's also like uh, sometimes we we got so desperate with UK uh, resistance and obstruction of various EU initiatives, especially in the area of defense, that some of us may have thought at a certain moment, well, good riddance, yeah, well, finally they are gone and, and we can go ahead, uh, full steam ahead in deepening our integration, including in the area of CRSP and in the area of CSDP. Well, to be honest, um, okay, but it's not the fact that the UK has left that will suddenly lead to great dynamics. Uh, we need to find those dynamics with, with ourselves. Uh, we, we don't need a negative motivation. We need a positive motivation and, and sufficient uh, positive political will of the current 27 member states to deepen um, our um, not just defense and security action, but also to, to, to make the EU let's say, in a very comprehensive manner, a much more, um, say, efficient and, and um, um, well, um, solid international uh, actor. So, I mean, there are interesting initiatives. I have, I've referred to some of them, uh, such as the European Commission that, and the European External Action Service, which are now much more, let's say, geopolitically alert. Huh? We have been for a very long time extremely naive in the European Union with regard to some actors, including with regard to China and Russia and so on. But I think that now uh, with the, the bitter experiences that we see also with COVID-19, um, we have become more alert. We also know that we cannot continue to rely on our traditional transatlantic allies like the United States and the United Kingdom is, is, is lost some I think it, it, it is time for us to, to have a quite um, thorough reflection on how we are now going to go forward in the area of CRSP and CSDP. I don't think we should just uh, allow to happen what has been with the case with us from time, time and again, namely that external crisis determine our political will. Uh, if you look a little bit at the EU's policies with regard to counterterrorism, it's crisis driven. A new terrorist attack, London, Madrid, Paris, and so on, you get new initiatives, and then it slows down. Also, in foreign policy, I mean, if we hadn't had uh, the, the crisis in Kosovo in 99, 
we would probably not have had, at least not so quickly, the Cologne and the Helsinki uh, European Council conclusions uh, and so on. So, I mean, uh, I think that rather than waiting for the next external threat and crisis to happen, which besides was also the case with the migration crisis, we should, we should maybe anticipate new crisis and we should uh, fully start uh, working on our own uh, capabilities. You know, it's not very easy because we have been spoiled for so many decades by a nuclear umbrella of the United States and so on. So, I mean, it, it requires a, a very, uh, say, different way of thinking. And I hope that we will um, be coming more ready for that. But I still doubt whether we have an adequate institutional framework for it. CFSP remains a problematic field. And I don't have wonder solutions like, I mean, what I indicated, the idea of introducing qualified majority voting. Don't trust on it. The member states don't like it. And, and moreover, for foreign policy, you need consensus. But what you really do need is to continue to forge a sense of unity and a, and a very high awareness of the fact that the world is not a friendly place. Our traditional allies are not trustworthy. Uh, there are uh, brutal and aggressive, uh, 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 well, we call them rising powers or emerging powers, but in fact, they are already the powers that are there. And um, we should be aware that as European Union, we are not necessarily loved elsewhere in the world. Huh? We are looked at with suspicion by other countries. We are also the ones who continue to preach on human rights and democracy, what have you, to others. And I'm not saying that is wrong. But uh, the problem is we have a certain history and past ourselves, which we should not always be very proud about. So instead of the moral finger pointing at the others, I think we, we, we need some modesty. But at the same time, we need more robust development of our own uh, security and defense uh, instruments. I realize that this is just a very, very personal and partial answer to your uh, excellent question, but I hope uh, at least you you, you can um, um, you can do something with the reply. Thank you. I think I think they were indeed very very excellent remarks and also very very insightful. Um, so do, do you uh, do we have any other live question? Somebody who would like to take the floor to ask a question? Because otherwise I will have a question for Professor Federico Lenzerini. So I. I, I take my uh, uh, I, I take advantage of my role to ask a question from Professor Lenzerini. Uh, Federico was, uh, you know, talking a lot about the common European uh, EU asylum system. I would like just to ask, very in a very very short way, uh, uh, what is, uh, in his opinion, the impact of the jurisprudence or the action of the European Court of Human Rights? So can can what are what are the consequences of the existence of this very powerful European court affiliated with a different institution, of course, the Council of Europe? But uh, can you can you tell us something in this respect? Thank you, thank you, of course, thank you for the question, which is very uh, interesting for me in particular because. Um, uh, I have al always been very curious about the, the, the relationship between the European uh, Court of Human Rights and European Union in general, especially in this field. Uh, in fact, the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights has determined, and I'm, I'm starting from the, in my opinion, the most important the influence played by the European Court of Human Rights as determined the first revision of the Dublin regulation uh, following a famous case, which is MSS versus Belgium and Greece. And it was an interesting case because in that occasion, uh, the applicant was a refugee uh, from Afghanistan, if I'm not wrong, and he arrived in Europe in Greece. Then he was able to move to Belgium and Belgium applying the Dublin regulation sent the applicant back to Greece because according to the regulation, Greece was the competent state to evaluate the asylum request. 
And at the time, there was a legal presumption according to which all European Union member states uh, were to be considered safe countries for refugees. So uh, giving, uh, ensuring the, the, the respect of human rights according to the relevant international standards, including the standards defined by the European Court of Human Rights itself. So when there was an instance of application of the Dublin regulation, uh, the state which deported the asylum seeker to the country of first arrival, even of course EU member state, did not investigate on whether or not this country was effectively safe for the applicant. So as a result of this approach, uh, notwithstanding the, the existence of the Dublin regulation and the approach of the European Union, the European Court of Human Rights considered that Belgium was responsible of the violation of Article 3 of the Convention because has sent the applicant back to Greece, which in fact was not a safe country. Because in Greece, the applicant suffered a certain violations of his human rights, which were contrary to the European Convention. So following this judgment of the European Court of Human Rights, also the European Court of Justice accepted the requirement that when applying the Dublin regulation, all member states had to ascertain for the instant case whether or not the country of first arrival was actually safe for the, for the refugee. So this was probably the, the most important impact played by the European Court on Human Rights on the common European asylum system. But uh, this is the most important example concerning the fact that uh, the jurisprudence of the European Court on Human Rights must be respected. So not only the convention, but also the way the convention is applied by the court when uh, applying the uh, common European asylum system in practice. Thank you for your answer. Do we have any live intervention also for Professor Pardolesi or for, uh, uh, I don't want to take too much advantage of my role here because I would have other questions. So please take the floor if you have questions for also for the other speakers. Uh, Ricardo, I might uh, take oh, the floor. Professor Ventura. Yeah, I'm uh, uh, interested in the possibility to uh, look at the uh, European uh, laboratory and, and even the EU laboratory as one of uh, a uh, broader uh, approach to security. Of course, we have sort of hard security in terms of uh, uh, anti-terrorism uh, activity and, and of course security in terms of weapons and common defense. I'm wondering, uh, and this is a question to both uh, Jan Wouters and Roberto Pardolesi, to what extent uh, we could see Europe as a, an actor of security uh, in terms of uh, uh, growth uh, and, uh, and cooperation. So to, to, to what extent a system of growth, uh, a competitive system, in particular in technology, thinking of artificial intelligence, uh, could, could help uh, build Europe as an actor of global security while making Europe a more secure place for itself. So we, uh, I'm, I'm building this question on some experience with DEFCO and, and cooperation. So co cooperation as, 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 as a growing, uh, and, and DEFCO as an institution, as a growing factor for the interaction of Europe with the world, would that be, can we see DEFCO and cooperation 
as a, a, a factor for security? Can we see research and innovation in the EU as a factor for security? Or this is just dreaming about uh, an, an idealized world? And, and probably more to Roberto Padolesi, then the question would be what you've been describing as a, as a development of a highly sophisticated, for how tense, but highly sophisticated European system of data protection. Could, could that be a, a, a competitive factor uh, for Europe, uh, again, enhancing the security system inside and outside the EU? So, Professor Pardolesi, you have the floor first, and then we will hear uh, Jan Bauter's uh, reply. Fine, I'm lost uh, with a question like that. It's, it's really, it's, it's really terrific, and uh, I wonder whether I can uh, try to uh, figure out a kind of answer. Let me say that uh, there is a, a European dimension, and this European dimension, when dealing with uh, uh, privacy, protection of personal data, is obviously staring all over the world since. Uh, there is nothing which compares to the European approach, so that the uh, general data protection regulation is obviously standard and uh, might be considered uh, the only actual discipline regarding the development, technological development in the field, so that, uh, for instance, if you look at California, one of the uh, um, states uh, of the Union responsive to the need to protect privacy, they obviously look at the general data protection regulation as a, a, a standard reference, uh, so that you can imagine that our uh, European sensitivity to this kind of problem is obviously extremely important in order to uh, uh, shape uh, an overall picture generally for uh, development uh, organized according to the respect of uh, uh, fundamental rights and so on and so forth. But this is probably uh, too optimistic a uh, view, I would say, since there is obviously also a possibility to look and get a glass from the other angle, and then you will discover that, for instance, the two most recent judgments by the uh, Court of Justice, uh, precisely on the issue of personal data protection, and the applicability, the enforceability beyond the uh, uh, boundaries of Europe, uh, so that the possibility of considering the European standard as, in a sense, uh, uh, compelling also for uh, 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 other um, uh, countries, well, has been uh, substantially rejected, and even the Court of Justice has been obliged to recognize that also within the boundaries of Europe, there is a different way of approaching the problem of confronting the fundamental rights to privacy on the one hand, protection of personal data, and uh, uh, right to communicate, uh, uh, freedom of speech, and so on and so forth. Even in Europe, obviously, we do not have a consistent basis on which uh, to predicate such, such uh, an uh, uh, an equilibrium and a program like that. And so that the court, the court was finally obliged to say that this is a problem with every single state, which means that we are, if I can answer this way, in a very shy uh, uh, um, uh, mode to the uh, 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 intricate and uh, right question by Professor Ventura to say that it depends, obviously, it depends from the perspective and there is a lot of things that should be uh, still considered in order to have a final uh, view, uh, an overall view, uh, with the uh, uh, possibility of divining uh, uh, a future, be it bad or good. Okay, thank you. Professor Walters. Well, thank you very much. It's a, it's a very uh, important question, but also a very broad question. And so I, I'm a little bit afraid time does not allow us to fully elaborate it, but I would kindly suggest that we have a follow-up conference or workshop about it, because it's a very important question. And I, 
As you know, um, the European Union has been working on a so-called comprehensive approach to security and, and trying to really bring all its, its policy tools and instruments together to support um, the hard security uh, stuff. I think in any event, um, the hard security stuff also needs to be done. Let's not forget about that. I'm afraid that we have too often relied on the soft and the, say, the normative power of the EU. We also need a little bit more of hard power, I would think. But I agree, um, we, we need to, to, to use and to tailor our existing policy instruments to, to, to have that broader approach to security. And that can also indeed happen through research and development, our um, policies in that respect. Although I'm not sure if you have read in the past couple of weeks the criticism uh, of the EU with regard to, um, say, those issues. We have spent billions and billions of euros in European research money in all kinds of very important areas of technology, global health and what have you. But, uh, I mean, the, 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 the insights, the patterns, even uh, the intellectual property rights, and, and, and the operationalization has very often uh, happened totally outside of the European Union. So, I mean, taxpayers' money has been put in all these um, very important and, and expensive programs, but in fact, it has sometimes more benefited uh, third countries than the EU and the European population itself. So I think there again, we have to do a serious reflection on, on trying to not be naive anymore and know that the world is a very competitive place not just with regard to developing new um, technologies, new ideas, new, new um, um, say, medicines and what have you, um, and now especially the, the, the rush for a vaccine, um, but also that um, there is an unfriendly world out there and that you want to avoid that um, all that taxpayers' money is basically lost um, to the EU and that it's third uh, countries or companies from third countries that run away uh, with the problem. Uh, look at the area of um, artificial intelligence, look at the area of cyber security, but more generally data gathering and so on. Uh, there I'm a little bit afraid to say that we have lost out. And <clears throat> I think that here maybe it's not bad to, to bring another point uh, to the reflection, and that is um, the question of um, a new industrial policy. Um, it's back uh, in, the, in the line of thinking. Uh, the ones of us who are a little bit more senior will remember that in the 1970s, there was a lot of thinking in the European Commission about the need for an industrial policy. And there was a so-called Colonna Memorandum and so on and so forth. In those days, it was Japan that was seen as the big kind of uh, threat and, and challenge for, for the European unions. All of these things have changed, but I mean, Partially under the influence of our British friends, I'm a bit afraid that since the 80s and 90s, we have basically done away with industrial policy and have really focused on antitrust and competition policy, which is not, it's not wrong to focus on that. But we have also, in a certain way, not uh, again uh, reflected strategically on the need for making certain European champions as well, and not just, uh, let's say, having the big guys in other countries uh, outside of Europe operating. And I think there is now a new prise de conscience, a new awareness in the Commission about this issue too. Thierry Breton has referred to it a number of times. And it's not a coincidence maybe that Breton has also been made Commissioner within his portfolio defense, which is quite amazing for the Commission, a portfolio including uh, explicitly defense. So I think there too, we may have to rethink and, and uh, think also about the need for a stronger EU industrial policy with regard to defense. It's not easy because, uh, to make just a legalistic point, those of you who know the treaty as well, industrial policy is just a supporting policy mentioned in Article 6 of the TFEU. So this is by no means what you call a very strong area of uh, EU competence. And in a certain way, the same applies to certain health issues. And I've made myself that reflection in the COVID-19 response. I mean, the health competences of the EU are in a certain way also problematic. So, I mean, in a certain way, we also need to reflect again about whether the, the competence structures and the expertise in the institutions with regard to those current challenges 
are really up to the task and whether we need some new um, th thinking about that. Again, the conference on the future of Europe may be a good place, but I'm not sure when that conference will kick off, if it ever kicks off. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Walters. So do, do we have any further intervention from the floor, from, from the others, from the audience? I think we just have time for one more question, if we have it. Otherwise, it's just time to wrap up our discussion, to close our keynote session. Uh, if, if Professor Ventura agrees with this, we should uh, just uh, declare this uh, session closed. Uh, I would like personally to, uh, uh, to express my gratitude for the keynote speakers that were, took the time to be with us today and to be so patient and wait until the end of this session. Of course, my hope is that I will meet you in person in the future at the next conference. So thank you so much. And for those who would like to follow our discussions in the following days, we reconvene tomorrow morning at 9.30. So bye-bye, everybody. Thank you for, for your attention.